outside world are blind. They do not believe. They have no faith. But I will make them see. <laughs> And the voice shouted, Come and see, and I saw. When the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, behold, a white horse, and he went out to conquer. There's something about this intro. It's the same thing that lives at the heart of all of Far Cry 5. We're forced to stand a couple meters behind our allies as we crawl through the galleries of Predator's eyes. What if they cut us off? The Marshal doesn't seem to understand the consequences of messing with these people. We are the locusts in their garden. His garden. Joseph Seed, the father, speaks like he knows something. Something we don't. So he offers his wrists to be restrained, and he comes willingly, without worry or fear. God will not let us take him. And God didn't let us take him. Nancy at dispatch can hardly control herself. She begs to be reassured. Are you there? Is, is somebody there? Please. I told you God wouldn't let you take me. Please. I need to know what's going on. Dispatch? Oh God. Everything is just fine here. We were always alone, and the wolves are coming. Easily in the top 10 anime betrayals, but it takes the medal for the strongest introduction the series has ever seen. It informs everything that is to come. It holds the secret. It holds both of them. Throughout the video, I ask you to look for it. Listen out for what this game has to say. I read a comment the other day that highlighted what's common among the games I like to talk about. They're average, or at least, that's how they're perceived. I hadn't even realized myself, but how can I deny it when recording for Far Cry 5? Thing is, I've never considered this a hit or miss franchise. Ignoring the spin-offs, I've yet to play an entry I haven't loved. So much so that Far Cry 4 is one of my favorite games ever made. Controversial, I know. What dulled the idea of that game for many was its similarity to its predecessor. What dulled the idea of Far Cry 5 for many was its similarity to everything. 2020 was, of course, the year America became the setting for a Far Cry. Or was that 2018? I don't know, I can't tell. But the point is, it isn't even a Far Cry. Originally, I considered the limits of my perspective. The Caribbeans are exotic to me, but that's relative. America may be exotic to them. Then I remembered one vital detail. I'm not from America. It's the other side of the planet. This will work. Oh yeah. It will. I got a cheetah tank back here. We'll air it up. It's just a tank to shoot air at one time. The language is relatively similar, but like the time differential, the landscape is night and day. America may be fresh for Far Cry, but it sure as shit isn't for media. Montana was the smartest choice in a nonetheless familiar country. My concern was that Far Cry 5 wouldn't feel like Far Cry, but I'd only get my answers in time. The issue at hand is if it'd look that way. I love Europe. But I wouldn't want to play an open world composed of green fields sectioned with green trees and nothing but, as far as the eye could see. What do you see? 
It's a remarkably endearing novelty to walk through these lovingly rendered woodworked American homes, and through the windows, your eyes are met with fur trees, a blistering orange sun, and the dry yellow fibres it's kissed. Beautiful, but uniform, no? Perhaps we ought to get a bird's eye view. See that? That's Angel's Peak. Cult built a statue to the father not long after they established themselves in the county. I think it needs a little redecorating. And with the dust settled, this is a statement. And our perch. Hope County. Maybe I was too quick to judge. Despite our vantage point, Hope lacks the verticality of Karat, and that way the wingsuit is far less emphasized. It also saps the world of a sense of drama. But at that point, we're arguing over whether the Himalayas are a cooler location than Montana. Trees and fields have a lot to give, if only you squeeze every artistic notion out of them with believability left intact. See that? Jacob lives in the White Tail Mountains, and at the base of the valley and this very hill is Faith's Henbane River, muted greens dotted between dry foliage and the white glint of the bliss. John picked a simpler place for his reaping. Holland Valley is the farmland of the county. Choices, choices, choices. Oh, I do mean to put Far Cry 5's beauty on display, but this is something more than an exercise in vanity. You see, 5 is uniquely open-ended for the series. We are deep in Ubisoft's world-based paradigm now, where your experience is defined by your progression through a colossal landscape, instead of a story-based campaign. Freedom wins, story suffers. Every. Single. Time. Where Ghost Recon Wildlands sought no compromise, and took world over story to an as of now, unmatched height. Far Cry 5 splits three campaigns between three regions of the map. Within those campaigns, mission sequences are freeform too. Though there will be scripted events at certain markers, you can begin the quest for Peaches or Grace or Nick whenever you please. Oftentimes, like in Origins or Odyssey, you're naturally guided into a route by level or region difficulty. This game only has the means to do the latter, but it nonetheless chooses not to. I suppose in a proud display of their dedication to freedom, each region is redundantly labelled Level 1. Though not entirely comfortable with this setup, Ubisoft makes sure to recommend John's region to you first. I suppose we ought to get a closer look. John Seed, a self-help guru gone wrong. Through the power of yes, he will show you the path. For there is nothing so blissful in the world to accept the word of the Father into your heart, even if it means you suffer in agony before you do. How does that make you feel? Scared? Or horny? And yes, those are your two choices. The amount of thirst posting I've seen from girls in the comment section could almost compete with the people who genuinely fell in love with Faith. <laughs> yeah, that's a rabbit hole we're not going down, but if you want a little additional reading, you might want to check out the 100,000 view John Seed X Reader fanfictions on Wattpad. Honestly, might be a better sequel than New Dawn. John spent his life looking for more things to say yes to. Yes, I will have an absolutely legendary beard. Yes, my region will be proof that Ubisoft have the talent to make Montana a captivating setting, despite the lack of previous locations' inherent drama. We've got the farms, we've got the tractors, everything seems to fit a mesmerizing rural American archetype. Apart from these apples. Maybe Americans are right about GMOs. What the fuck is this man? They're putting fucking dodecahedron apples in our food and turning the horses gay. There's a comfort in Pastor Jerome's walls. Can you feel it? Hope. I feel a sermon coming on. Phones, computers, the Lord has blessed us with the means to smite non-believers, even from the comfort of our own home. But brothers and sisters, we are not safe. You tell him, Ren. The sea and the blue light screen glare lives in our hearts, our minds, and our eyeballs. I must profess in the face of God that I too know sin. The devil has cursed me with insomnia and involuntary eye spasms, for he was offended that I attempted to moderate the Lord's NSFW trad wife subreddit 25 hours per day. But what if I told you he spoke, good people? He had presented me a holy miracle. Chuck, my son, can you testify as to what word beginning with the letter G comes after gamer? Um, go? You keep your degenerate mouth shut, boy, or so help me God, I will deliver the Lord's justice upon you. Glasses, the father, Joseph Seed, has pronounced himself prophet, and in the face of God, I believe so help me. I believe he is the lamb returned to pasture, for his eyes sit. GMG Performance Eyeglasses. I presume the G stands for Gabriel, because no mortal man could produce such holy craftsmanship. We do not see with his eyes, so we cannot see the glory 
of his plan. Look upon this art through his lands, his brothers and sisters, and you may see the righteous path in RPG video games. The Lord in heaven above does not forgive the soul of the man who lets his eyeballs succumb to disease. But he is proud, people. I say proud of the man who scores a righteous kill to death ratio by employing the gift of a limited Black Friday discount at checkout. Amen. Happy Sunday, folks. Y'all can go home now. Fool's End is where you're subtly guided towards first, and having liberated it, it represents a comforting safety at the heart of the valley, the eye of the storm. See what a good person I am? I save their lives, and then I save their souls. With no predetermined progression path or mission order, the fear was that Far Cry 5 would inevitably lack the pace and structure of previous games. These villain resistance meters are a direct response. Nearly everything you do progresses it, and so in lockstep with your time and effort, a region can still have a sense of pace by the escalation of enemy presence and measured confrontations with the villains. Let's make John fear us. Could be overcome. Far Cry 5's missions and outposts are no break in convention, gobsmackingly strong level design, and bog standard gameplay scenarios. To flesh out the world, the county instead hopes to make travel a meaningful and routinely engaging activity, in one way by dotting the world with key destructibles, and in another by making the roads just the danger they were before, but never more incentivized. Destroy a transport, kill a high value target, stop and loot a truck, save a civilian. Activities are simple, but beckon strong gameplay all the same. Bullets overpenetrate. You must be exceptionally precise in how you stop prisoner transports, or you'll clip the innocents within. This is about as interesting as they get, but not more or less compelling. Let me ask you this, what is Far Cry's gameplay about? I wish the developers had reminded themselves more often. You'll see. In Call of Duty, or any such shooter, engagements occur level by level, most often in enclosed spaces. Whereas in Far Cry, encounters can happen between any factions at any time, likely on a road, perhaps in a forest. So as a direct result, dynamism guarantees consistently interesting variation, and more emphasis is placed on what makes Far Cry unlike its contemporaries. Use trees for cover, use vehicles for cover, use wild animals, escape, lead your pursuers into a trap or astray entirely. This even applies to core FPS pillars. Aim is still a primary skill, but gravity and travel time are far more of a factor, because world design encourages longer ranges, and balancing puts emphasis on the bow. Positioning is still a primary skill, but now there's foliage to shroud yourself, and the direction from which you tackle the level can be altered entirely. Far Cry sets a decent, familiar FPS in a vast, rich, immersive sandbox, the nature of which enhances core FPS pillars, dynamically ensures consistency consistent variation, and is balanced to make engagements with sandbox elements likely. This is why Far Cry is so much deeper than a standard analogue. It's also why Far Cry plays like Far Cry. But what makes it feel that way? A wild setting for one, and a predator-prey dichotomy. Power balance. As opposed to Far Cry 4, its sequel brings back the starting power differential of its prequel. With few weapons and no idea what the mainland cult are capable of, the sense of danger influences nearly all of your choices in a way that promotes interesting decision making, and discourages a devil-may-care attitude. In other words, it's as good for the gameplay as it is for the immersion when you're fearfully sneaking through abandoned houses and considering the smartest route through the brush. Pre-planning, especially with a map, is rare. Far Cry is more often reactionary. It is in the heat of the moment that you may pick my way over the highway. I'd wager that's why you see such winding roads in the county. Being so indirect makes them noticeably inefficient, thereby promoting consideration over blindly following the GPS. 
Far Cry begs to be played on a difficulty setting one higher than you'd typically choose for an FPS. You can imagine how this fortified bridge is nothing more than set dressing for just cause, but a genuinely intimidating encounter in an appropriately tough Far Cry. Even if I take out the men guarding it, anyone else could show up at any time. And like 3, it is this player behaviour at the start that creates such palpable progression in contrast with your behaviour at the end. It's no surprise that in America, blisteringly paced weapon progression has the power differential change much sooner. Far Cry 5 holds little back. It should have. A subjective matter of difficulty it may be. But I can compare like to like. It only stood to benefit from playing prey instead of predator for longer. One for contrast, two for something more. Hunter is good. Serves 5 better. That's certainly the philosophy it took to its villains. We've angered John. He's coming. Far Cry 5 had the understandably daunting task of having to justify both your kidnap and your escape eight separate times. John's region coasts on the hope you'll come here first, because it attempts little for the sake of variety. You are being hunted. Capture party. You are being hunted. Capture party. As your second or third region, this will quickly feel inorganic, but we're about to feel a hell of a lot more than that. Far Cry 5 flexes its talent for drama routinely. Excellent performances, voice and body, compelling dialogue, strong framing, bewitching music. The cutscenes are praiseworthy across the board, but usually, this cinematic talent serves as a vehicle for an idea, a suspicion, an emotion. What does it serve for John? Among the Christianisms within the project are, of course, the eight deadly sins. Pride, gluttony, and envy of which are engraved by knife into the father's back. Which leaves five remaining. One of them is yours. And as you progress, John attempts to find it. Is it greed? No. Sloth? No, I'm blatantly not a sloth. Might be lust, but that was an accident, officer, I swear. Wrath? Could be. Or... Cringe. Agreed. Penance to John isn't deleting your Reddit account. It's torture, and then mutilation. Hmm. Complete and unquestionable insanity is not a good trait for these people. They scarcely have the time to be deeply fleshed out, so they're only interesting if they're believers. But baseless justifications for sadism can't be grappled with in any philosophical sense. John is less radical Christian Saul Goodman and more radical Christian Joker, with a power of yes as his why so serious. Joseph even saw that to a degree, but there was nothing but a thin backstory and an endearing charisma to John. He was the smart player to start people on, but he is not played smartly. Let's get out of here. These bindings are giving the Wattpad writers too many ideas. Believable external factors set you free the first time. The other? Truly a genius move that John gave you a chair with wheels on it. And it turns out that if you throw yourself down a flight of stairs, you don't break your neck, but you do break rope tied between your wrists. What a twat. You see, John Seed is an advertisement, not unsurprising for the cult's propagandist. Law states he used his charisma to win the cult's legal battles in its formative years. Interesting that this quality is paralleled in his region. This is propaganda for the game. Literally, the pre-release gameplay and the three character profiles pertain solely to those found in John's region, because their familiarity and accessibility make for easy appeal. Pastor Jerome, Pastor Alfredo's God-fearing cousin, Mary May, sharp-tongued bartender, and Nick Rye. He's rootin', he's tootin', and by God, he's shootin'. The goal is accessibility and conformity. What else could explain the ways Far Cry 5 streamlines itself? You no longer need to hunt for upgrades. Takedowns are vastly less brutal. And doors actually function. That sure as shit doesn't feel like Far Cry. I wouldn't be kidding if I said the same for the lack of healing animations. Making the choice of to heal or not to. Taking the time to do so, these are depths that still exist, but no longer ravage your time and focus. The more you're considering tactics, the better. But without being able to heal up quickly from 
low. Doomed situations are far more common, wars of attrition are harder to support, and response time is always limited by however long it takes for regen to kick in. Making desperation hard is good, making it less interesting? No. To achieve the same goals, it's in John's region, Far Cry 5 The Trailer, that you'll find the overwhelming majority of this game's action. Look guys, we have explosions just like Call of Duty! We're awesome too! Far Cry is fun because it's free, and because it's dangerous. It isn't a surprise, then, that when story missions fail to play to these strengths, preconceived notions about what a campaign should be must be discarded. Being a wonder of vehicular battles and a ghost in outposts won't help you here, because in its set pieces, Far Cry 5 does not test its own gameplay. This is about grenades, aim and cover, with scripted reinforcements in an enclosed arena. This isn't just like Call of Duty, it is. So Far Cry, if you remove everything that makes it Far Cry. Not an unsatisfactory foundation, but when you play one of these games you expect the times you spend with the characters, in high budget scripted moments, to be the highlights. They might have been. You can keep me bewitched by the carnage, with enough theatricality, but Ubisoft severely struggle to keep that consistent. Or to even keep me alive. You want to know what the toughest region is on hard? Jacob, surely? No, it's John. Far Cry's design compels turning up the difficulty, but if you play along, you'll find these badass scripted power fantasies ended in seconds. If I'm stuck in a turret or invisible play boundaries, I have no choices. I may have to degenerate to something exploitative, boring and routine. A comedy routine, but the kind that gets you on Twitch fails. Or live leak, depending on how close you are to a window. Yet to the exact opposite effect, John's region arbitrarily remembers it's meant to be the beginning, and massively overcorrects on tutorialization. Flying Nick Rye's plane is shallow, and I'm not talking about the altitude. You're directing a slow-moving but quick-turning seaplane through giant yellow hoops for three minutes straight. After having sent nearly the entire population of Montana after me, Far Cry 5 now assumes I don't know how to use the left thumbstick. Following NPCs is a rare but similarly mind-numbing setup. Is that a plane? Is there something waiting round the corner? No, there's not. There is moving forward. Herc, for example, has you sitting in the passenger seat of his car, while he drives you up a mountain and talks. What could I possibly enjoy about these missions? Step one, catch a day buzz off party liquor. Got that one covered. Step two, pray for someone else to solve my problem. Done. Step three is... Shit. Shit, I forget the rest, but... They'll come to me as soon as, soon as we go. Well, in this case, I'd be excited because of the talking. Ubisoft have a knack for expressive personalities. Some people, like Jess Black, have absolutely nothing going for them. But others, like Herc, can work to offset the shallow gameplay. Theatricality, entertainment value, all of these things come naturally to scripted campaigns. But given its scale, Far Cry 5 routinely forgets. John's region is a problem, as much as it is a reflection of the way Far Cry 5 seeks to emulate 3's power balance, but expand on 4's action focus all the same. And freed from scripted chains, that idea has space to blossom. American Far Cry. Or should it be British, because it naturally seeks to expand? This time with mercenaries. Arms for Hire is a dynamic difficulty setting. Different from summons, only in that they're even more of a contrast, because the world doesn't scale to account for them. If you bring Cheeseburger along, you can pretty much fall asleep. If you bring Cheeseburger and Jess, the game will actually complete itself, and when you come back from the store, you'll be on New Game Plus. Nevertheless, it's extremely fun to watch the carnage with these animals, and if you keep your choices in check, you can maximally extract an acceptable level of challenge to complement a considerable degree of tension. I found the system at its best with the randomly generated allied NPCs putting up a fight against the cult. These are red-blooded Americans, and you don't want them pulling a gun on you, or they might fire a warning shot and dome a badger 300 meters way or something. But when you come to bond with them, the permanence of their deaths can feel like a genuine threat. Watch out! You are a tool. Complementary to that of the Reign of Fire, an attempt to sway things back in the direction of Far Cry 3's balance, planes and helicopters are a natural consequence of 5's escalation. If you've got a bigger arsenal, and oh boy you do, the enemy needs one to balance. This is that. 
Planes will give you a respectable fight on foot or in a vehicle, where their bombs will actually account for your trajectory. They aren't too tough or too easy no matter your situation. You've got as many options as you can think of to respond, even including going up there yourself and having a dogfight, where you might just notice a problem. Lacking the turbulence and frailty of Far Cry 4's gyrocopter, these machines imbue you with the numbing power of God. Helicopters are easy to control, relatively sturdy, and often armed to the teeth. That makes them dull at best for long-distance traversal, and spectacular but ultimately shallow for service-to-air combat. Mainly, they and the planes are endearing in air-to-air -air confrontations, where they present a novel and reasonably balanced gameplay experience. I can only complain so much about power differentials, because in these machine gods, they're so great you'd have to be willing to suffer a shallow husk of the game you bought in order to exploit it. I prefer to engage them on my own terms. Armor-piercing ammo becomes quite the commodity in Hope County, what with the abundance of armor and the incentive to pierce it. It's a strong aspect of resource economy, and oh so satisfying. That's as much a testament to those provocative reload animations. Far Cry Sandbox is so broad by now I can watch peaches get launched into the air by a moose, fight it to the death and very almost lose, then be instantly harassed by one of Faith's planes, shoot it down after a protracted battle with armor-piercing rounds, take a pot shot at the parachuting pilot, get into a fight with the angels a minute later, and then be attacked by the pilot, who walked all this way to get his revenge. This was memorable for its bombastic identity, but the structure of multiple dynamic factions intertwining to create continually interesting gameplay defines Far Cry, and five specifically at its best. It is at its best most often. To fast travel would be a sin for simply going along these roads of Far Cry 5's tensest moments, and its most exhilarating. It's a dopamine factory. An addiction. I adore Far Cry 5's action, but only in its purest form. Free form. Set pieces present you with minimal choices, but car chases? Anything can happen, and I have every power to make it so. It is no surprise, then, that when missions understand this, they walk from the troughs to the peaks. Angel's Peaks. Remember that statue we destroyed? It's a mission, and among the game's best. It's scripted, but not on rails, and that which has to happen is exactly the theatricality meant to sell these set pieces. You're free to destroy Joseph in any way you please. Chopper, plane, bombs, arrows, rockets. That plays to Far Cry's strengths, but when the dust settles, you'll see his worship is hiding within the skeleton. Now we're using the rubble as cover. You make the arena. And when you're finished, you'll climb through it as Joseph sends his minions to harass you from the air. Theatricality perfected. This mission is a gem. The Revelator similarly struck me as a standout. Turns out, Far Cry 5 is a better Mad Max game than Mad Max is. Oh please, don't be afraid. This guy's a pussy. His mates call him Optimus Grime. Come on. See this? I was in the Navy SEALs, you know. They do this all the time. There we go. Scandinavian flick. Yeah, you better run. Bitch. Oh. Ah, uh, shit. Ah, yeah. See, that's that's hard difficulty. Nobody fucking clicked that. It's okay, ladies and gentlemen. I have a plan. You see this? Three bombs. Proximity. Car over there. I'm the bait. So now I just need to master bait. But I won't need to, after I get laid, for how genius this plan is. You see? Here he comes. Yeah, you guys know, they don't hand out fucking silver plaques for nothing. Uh, uh, yep. Yeah. Should've just, should've just taken the OnlyFans money. Would've been easier, would've been happy. Alright, so this is my first time at trying to take down the Revelator, guys, as you can see. Oh, first time! Look at that! Instantly! Good god, I'm good at this game. I'm just ridiculous. This is- I'm just ridiculous! John, time's up. For the first time, you come to him in the pastor's church. His charisma is utterly magnetic. The tension is gripping. They hold nothing back in their brutality, and your third escape is among the most believable of the lot. Remember how Jerome keeps a gun in his Bible? What's that symbol on the book we're being asked to swear upon? Doesn't look like Eden's gate to me. Get 
By Joseph's decree, each seed was given one of Hope County's bunkers. These are their strongholds and the home of their loyalists. You'll know the region is free of their disease when the rat's nest is cleared. You'll clear it like Call of Duty. And I don't hate that. So which is it? Drama? Theatricality? Humor? It's the same as it is there. We've even got the missile silos. Going out with a bang? John the Baptist. Like the saint, he also dies at 32. Fall's End can sleep easy tonight. Though the church could do with some redecorating, we might not be closer to God. But I assure you, way up where we're going, you'll be closer to heaven. The sword of Eden's gate is nested in these mountains. The Bible says Jacob died aged 147 years. I look forward to proving the Bible wrong. God damn, I need to quote Reverse Flash more often. Anyway, the Whitetail Mountains compose the shortest region of the three, and despite presentations, a challenge no greater than John's. That's John's fault, of course, but it is noteworthy, given stone, blood-laden, knife-point presentation. Like Faith, to mix things up, Jacob's region introduces a new enemy type, the Judges, wolves trained under Jacob's watch. They obey his command, but have never been more ferocious, or quiet. Being so small and so silent, you can often be mauled to death out of nowhere with far too weak a telegraph. Occupying the exact same archetype as any melee-focused enemy, and failing to contribute anything interesting beyond it, the Judges are novel, and not much more. To parry Jacob, you'll need allies. The White Tail Militia, a now underground group of locals, using guerrilla tactics to snipe at Jacob's forces. They're public enemy number one. And needing even fewer resistance points than John or Faith, we're already close to capture. By now, more problems are starting to show. A lot of the time, I'd intentionally avoid playing the game as I normally would, because I didn't want to get kidnapped before finishing what I was trying to do. 2,000 meters to the next mission? It'd be 2,000 meters of shy away from every encounter to avoid triggering the next capture. And if I do, my time's up. It's seconds before the bliss dart hits, and the skies are no sanctuary. Even in a plane, Jacob manages to nail his quickscopes, which I'd call unbelievable, but he was an army sniper. And when he's got you, you'll be put through basic training. He does it again and again, and never will it make a great deal of sense. You're told he can't kill you because Joseph needs you alive, but the continual speeches about the weak come across as a lazy routine for bringing the characters together. It is. It's a routine. It was all part of the plan. Jacob explains to you that he's mastered the technique of classical conditioning, a learned response to various stimuli, and in your case, it's a music box that compels you to kill. He knows you're with the white tails, so he doesn't need to find them. He just needs to complete your training and let you do your work. We cull the herd for the fourth time, but everything starts making just a little more sense if you pay attention to the details. Every run, we finish in a room. The same room. Recognize anything about it? It's the white tail bunker. It always has been, and where once the final weak man stood, now stands Eli. Jacob's plan is complete. You cull the herd. A lazy routine somehow uses itself to reach a brilliant conclusion. Color me in blood and then color me impressed. I needed to be, because Far Cry 5's drama, villains, and that secret we've yet to find are all it has to live on. Face reveal, yep, that's me, going for a bit of a Sarah Connor look, but I like to call her Bud Light McShotgun. She's not quite the girl White Light Chan was, but she's grown on me. Shit, they must have found my hard drive. Most people, though, call her Rook or Depp, and they might not like the response they get. Silence. Far Cry 5 makes the wild move of going for a mute protagonist, in contrast to RJ, Jason, and Bongo Bongo, presumably so you connect more with the situation you're in. We'll come to see the benefit, but the sacrifice was inevitable. The deputy can communicate only with body language, a reassuring hand on the back, a friendly clink of a beer, or helping Mary with her boxes. It's something of a substitute for voice, but no suitable replacement. When Hudson struggles to put a knife inside of you for 20 odd seconds, words could have ended in moments what it took a protracted life or death wrestle to communicate. An extension of this problem is routinely losing all sense of who the deputy is. Supposedly, she's motivated by rescuing her compatriots, but you are motivated by gameplay and villains. The game knows this, which is why it makes nearly no reference to anything that might compose the deputy's persona until the last couple villain confrontations of each region. The disconnect is so profound that I had entirely forgotten who my compatriots even were. Forget caring about rescuing Pratt. I didn't even know who Pratt was until I had 
had already rescued him, though that was just as much their fault as it was the deputies, because Far Cry 5 has the broadest, but least diverse group of allied characters in any entry yet. Broad, because there are at least three per region, and least diverse, because they're all the same. Eli is the same character as Pastor Jerome. Pastor Jerome is the same character as the Sheriff, who is the same character as Mary May, Nick Rye, and the list goes on. One of the greatest troubles with Far Cry 5's characters is that their differentiation is skin deep, a collection of costumes to veil a uniform archetype. You don't know their fears, aspirations, you hardly know their relationships, they don't develop because they are dimensionless, each in the same way, and each from start to finish. In his character profile, Ubisoft advertised a 98 second long vision of Pastor Jerome with incalculably more depth than his in-game portrayal. Deep religious reflections, commentary on the nature of Joseph, conviction, badassery, regret, in 98 seconds. But comparison is impossible between these two men because you cannot divide by zero. In the Whitetail Mountains, I was impressed by Jacob because I spoke to him, and when I did, he had something to say, but those who I am supposed to care for spoke rarely and only in drivel. Good honest folk out there, Depp, just gotta kill those goddamn Peggies! Starts to lose me after it's been said 350 different ways. I may have killed Eli, but to me, he was never alive. As easy as it is to blame the split for this, I nonetheless believe management is the true source of sin. Skylar Kors, a character who appears in a sum total of two side missions, was the most compelling allied character in the game. She was three-dimensional, from backstory to personality, and honestly, I wanted to bring her with me because I felt like I knew her. That took 10 minutes. Was it scarce resources to blame? Really? If it was, we should talk about Jess Black. She's so unfathomably bland that she's horseshoe theoried around to becoming endearing again, but her travesty of a mission took resources better spent on developing more for central characters. Equally, the missions that do involve the central characters would have been wiser to actually involve them. Eli, Tracy, Mary, these are all people in need of dimension, but instead their missions have them act solely as quest givers. They dictate the next location, but have no bearing on it. Far Cry 5 could have easily pulled off four compelling campaigns. The failure was in the execution, not the design document. Now my brother saw all this coming. I don't know if he talks to God. That doesn't matter. He was right. Humanity is once again in crisis. It doesn't matter. What we build or achieve, we will always find a way <laughs> to break it down. Babylon, Rome, empires rise, <laughs> empires fall. America, <sighs> we're no different. We think we're indestructible. World War II. War on terror. We survived it, but it only brought us closer to the edge. And this is where we are, right here, on schedule, just waiting for someone to push us. And oh boy, if you pushed us. <coughs> you did everything he said you would do. And you didn't even know it. There's a wolf now where Jacob made his last stand. It won't attack. It can only howl for Jacob's soul. Far Cry is supported by three pillars. Gameplay, setting, and villains. Hope is an enchanting stage for a brilliant sandbox. And Jacob has proven himself to be John Superior, but by his own interesting beliefs, he was not strong enough to uphold this narrative on such shallow foundation. Far Cry 5's story needs help. But what if there was a potential remedy that already existed? We need only find it. And there's only one place left to go. Faith is all alone. The shift in colours as you enter the Henbane River is profound. Because despite being a QT 3.14, Faith's theme is a psychedelic horror. Angels are a haunting title for her zombified victims. They won't give you COVID, but they will eat your face off, and only a shot to the head will put them down for good. That's the interesting quirk the judges lacked. When they're let loose and the strings have a panic attack alongside the player, my choice to pick Faith on Halloween was sanctified. 
You'll frequently run into apparitions of the woman herself as you start cutting into the region, but before long, she'll come to you with an offer. If you say yes, you'll wake up in the Bliss Realm, where Faith is an angel, and she tells you how she got her wings. This is a distinct break in convention for the game, but it's smarter still. As a girl, she was made to take a leap of faith to prove herself to the father. How did she survive? And when you see the marshal before that same ledge, the stakes are set, though not certain. Now it's your turn. I will give you purpose. I will set you free. You recover before the Hope County Jail, which is where the bulk of the story to come unfolds from. You don't have to comply. Faith's proactive nature in her own region creates this uniqueness to her story. And in keeping with its dynamism, you aren't always captured by force. I was just making my way to the next mission, when, as is so common in Hope County, I came across yet another hostage situation. I rammed the cultist, I went to untie the woman's bonds, but the cuffs were placed on me. When Faith hadn't sent a capture party right away like her brothers, I was wondering when she'd make her move. I never could have predicted I'd play right into it. It's how completely and utterly unexpected it was. It's how unique it was to me that makes this so endearing. We came here to find a cure. We found one in Faith's sickness. But as she's proven, there's always more than meets the eye. Take a closer look, and Far Cry 5's subtle narratives contribute a great deal. The ending is hinted at throughout the game, Faith's backstory is revealed in tenuous details or recordings in key locations, and you can even visit major settings in the cult's history, a brilliant way to boost believability. You can find the Seeds Ranch, you can find their first church, you can find the person who complained to the then inconspicuous Faith about the noise coming from the statue construction. You can find that person strung up and gored outside their home. But those examples specifically are simply the fruit of my luck. For any given location, it's an unlikelihood within an unlikelihood. One, that you find it. Two, that you explore it thoroughly enough to understand its significance. Environmental storytelling is fantastic, but people aren't that way predisposed for Far Cry like they are for Dark Souls, and Dark Souls doesn't need the help. Automatically played voice lines might have gone a long way. Similarly, Joseph's contemplations on the deaths of his family often provide meaningful backstory that I can't help but think should have been delivered beforehand. The villains are left with their charisma and beliefs to carry them, and in that, there may be yet another source of potential. I went on Twitter the other day, because all the other zoos were shut for coronavirus, and I found this. I also found this. A politics is a person with a small brain. Mark, age 11. Yep, agreed. But a politics can also be an interesting. There's a big difference between asking the game to tell me what to think, and asking the game to use its own assets to compel me to think. Assassin's Creed, Deus Ex, philosophical, ideological, even religious battles of ideas are often intriguing, and Far Cry 5 is no slouch. Joseph obviously carries libertarian sentiments with regards to guns, but that's about it. He is a staunch collectivist, which upon research isn't actually that surprising. He strongly opposed is the greed of the modern paradigm, stating that give was replaced with take, and that we value ourselves based on acquisitions. According to him, society is the way it is because some refuse to share, and always want more. We are blind to our obsessions, and our obsession is consumption. We consume all, and that is our sin. Greed. His treatment for society is naturally nothing conventional. He exists to save the strong few from the coming collapse. Ain't no time for reform. Instead, Joseph's solution is neo-Luddite to the core. So much so, I wouldn't be surprised if the cult text was just a reprint of Ted Kaczynski's manifesto. For those unaware, that's primitivism. He believes the only way forward is to go back, and rejects modern technology with a minimalist slant. It is only a clear reading of his economic ideas that eluded me on my first playthrough. How should resources be distributed? Fairly. But the right to participate must be earned. He and Jacob are Darwinist, and Jacob specifically rejects healthcare policy, labelling it a cancer in his manifesto. It's an odd amalgamation, but upon thought it aligns almost perfectly with his neo-Luddite views, and his immediate goals, that being to prepare his flock for the coming collapse. Cull the herd, Jacob preaches. Collectivism is the bison's strength, but the individual who falters must themselves become strong, or be left to the wolves. In the same way, many ancient tribes would simply leave the decrepit behind. And even in their music and less central speeches, there is much to explore. The cult could be seen as tempting, because in a world that judges you on so very much, they represent forgiveness and acceptance. We do not care what clothes you wear, only that you are clothed. 
We do not care what food you eat, only that you are fed. But they hypocritically repeat the cycle by inflicting the same thing as the modern world onto non-believers through concepts of sin, to name one possible idea of about 68 trillion. Far Cry 5 is not an unintelligent game, but in times of need, I wish, like the best Assassin's Creeds, it had exploited this resource more. The potential within each aspect of its subtle narratives might have been an effective cure for its most destructive disease. When you're being outdone by your own trailers, something's gone badly wrong. It has but one medication left to try. It's nebulous, but ever-present. It's the secret. Despite routine failure and such mispotential, it keeps this story on life support, and you won't even know it's there. You'll only know its name when everything ends. So, no time to waste. We've taken much from Faith since we entered the Henbane River. Her appearances have naturally become less amicable. Did you think you could just continue to do what you wanted without consequences? I don't know, ask the Watch Dogs to your writers. She seems to give up on you. She seems even to grow scornful. No longer will she leave you in peace, and perhaps that'll catch you off guard, having since adjusted so thoroughly to simply swatting her away. Every animal may be something worse. Every civilian, an angel. Every apparition, a haunting. Faith's emotion is sold even through her capture timings. At first, to reflect forgiveness, it's slow and unpredictable, but with time, the delay narrows. Until you pass into the Snoopscape instantaneously, Faith turned to revenge. Ah, oh, don't worry. I'll soon fix that. And we know what happens, do we? Only you can make all this world He's our savior. But you will be the one who decides what happens. You are the start. You'll be the end. It was always gonna happen this way. You'll walk the path. <laughs> You'll rescue your sheriff. You'll be... the hero. And then... chooses? Were you? Was all this real? Faith? She's dead, I think. And the lamb has broken the fifth seal. Hope County is ours, the cult is dead, and Joseph awaits us on his island. You can feel the sense of victory as you ride through the county, free from fear. Now that all that pent-up tension can be released, this is almost blissful. Might even turn the radio on. Joseph sent a decree to his followers near the cult's genesis to produce, and I quote, some absolute zesty bops, a phrase he got from the Bible. And I wouldn't be so surprised because this is holy. Far Cry 5 has among the best soundtracks to anything I've ever seen, heard, played, anything. And if there was any doubt to Dan Romer's brilliance, my favorite of all his touches is the way he divides the albums between all three seeds. John is belief, the choir when the world falls. Jacob is strength, the whole band into the flame. Faith is bliss, post-rock. We will rise again. Music you'd expect from rural America, co-opted by the cult. But remove the poison and, well, 
I'm not a religious man, but some of Hammock's reinterpretations are so genuinely powerful that just for a couple minutes, I feel like a believer. We're listening to cult classics in more ways than one, but they didn't have to be. Originally, they were intended to be as annoying as possible to incite some level of hatred in that irritation. Instead, they became what they are, infectious charms to their beliefs. In the West shall rise A sinister creed The rich will get what they want The poor will lose what they need The devil knows our fears He told all his friends Block the sun with their lies as darkness descends. Oh Lord, the great collapse won't be our end when the world falls into. towards our destruction and no one is willing to do anything about it. I can see that. You can see. But we are not crazy. So what are we supposed to do? We just sit back and await the inevitable? And I claim to be a perfect man. But I saw what was coming and I chose to act. To lead because society is broken and the only way forward is to go back to the way things once were innocent and pure so safe and protected in our garden I can save you we've missed something what did you say, Faith? It's not my fault. None of this was my fault. You think I wanted this? He plied me with drugs. He threatened me. I was 17. I was just a child. Are you trying to manipulate me? Or did you drop the act? What is it? What can I not see? Oh, after Angel's Peak. What have you done? His words. Don't you understand what he'll do to me? Faith, you do believe his words, right? It can't all be a ruse, I can't explain what you do. It's everywhere. It started at the beginning, when we're forced to stand a couple meters behind our allies, in the midst of ravenous foes. When the Marshal's bravado risked everything going to hell, and we didn't know if God would truly let us take him. It progressed, 
right behind you, when our entrance to Hope County set Far Cry 5 in a similar understanding to Far Cry 3. Despite being just the action game 4 was, it sprawled out into the world and followed us on our journey. Really, just listen. There's nothing there, but the sound design will always make you think there is. Like the Bliss, where in the Henbane River anything you see could be anything else. You'll question just what you think you truly know. It's true, drugging is rarely used to indoctrinate people into cults, but demonstrating miracles, as the Bliss does, is often used to convince followers of holy power. How could he heal that boy? In the same way, how is Faith doing this? Telepathy? Telekinesis? You can reach at explanations, but it is not easy to do so. The bliss is a part of a larger whole, but individually it represents the possession of an idea. Don't believe me? You will. Get it? Hey, but seriously, you will. So let's begin. That chemical formula, this flower, it ain't fiction. Scopolamine, found in the angel's trumpet, is known to produce euphoria but unpleasant hallucinations in the right dose, a torturous psychosis in others, and commonly described as the devil's breath, or the zombie drug, because the conscious trance you're left in can be exploited by the administer, to command, to spill secrets, to abuse the incapacitated, anything. It's a tool for crime in Colombia, but Eden's Gate has done something to it. And like any psychedelic, truth and fiction become indistinct. Can I see more to the world than there was before? Has my mind been opened? Or is the part of my brain that handles connections simply on fire, leading me to see patterns and fractals where they do not exist? There is a psychedelic in this game for the same reason as everything before. The idea of the coming collapse, the routine implications that you're walking a predetermined path, that there's something you're blind to, of bunkers that each of the seeds are based within, of prepper stashes scattered in the shadows, but frequently so, there's a word for that. And now there will be a revelation. For every slight, every injustice, Every choice reveals our sins. Resist or walk away. This is our final decision. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven, and the seven angels before God were given seven trumpets. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. And I heard a great voice from the temple say to the angels, Go your ways, and pour from the vials the wrath of God upon the earth. The secret, Far Cry 5's theme, is paranoia, and its message is you. Insanity, paranoia is not. It's a seed of truth, the fear of what could be that grows so monstrous it owns you, the paranoia that creates the almost unbreakable bond of one's mind to one's religion, the paranoia that compels suffering men to live in holes out of fear of what might come. It controls your choices. Now the world is on fire, a realization of an apocalyptic nightmare we all share, and a physical manifestation of the world's chaos. Why do you think that is? Why do some of you believe it's real? And why do some of you doubt it? You know what this means? It means the politicians have been silenced. It means the corporations have been erased. It means the world has been cleansed by God's righteous fire. Most of all, it means I was right. Apocalypse. Funny little word. In Greek, it means revelation, and for us, it explains a great deal. Eden's Gate saw nuclear war as the collapse. They took action when they did to build a people strong enough to survive it. Why did they choose bunkers to base themselves from? They are the project at Eden's Gate. You're looking at it. The gates to a new world, a new dawn. Look around you. This world is on the brink. You can feel it in your bones. Look at the headlines. <laughs> Look who's in charge. <coughs> you want this key? 
because you think you're saving people, but they are already safe. We had a plan. Joseph was right. Right? True to Far Cry 5's paranoia, yet another question it had you asking yourself was if this was his doing. The fire I know is surely real as that of discussion regarding this ending. There are six theories. I dismiss hallucinations because it's tantamount to saying there was no ending, leaving the two of importance, confirmation or hoax. Three bunkers, three silos, three blasts. Think that's a coincidence? Joseph might have fulfilled his own prophecy, so the claims go. Yet, meanwhile, the Far Cry world was on the brink of a nuclear war. The radio by the end warned that attack was overwhelmingly likely. Then, hoaxers would say that the cult blocked all comms, so the broadcast must have been fake. Prophets would respond that it was only outgoing signals that were jammed. Hoaxers would say that you don't see the nukes in the walkaway ending. And prophets would say that the walkaway ending was too brief to know. Just to describe a single instance of the appropriate fiery debates. The hoaxes were wrong for a number of reasons, that very new dawn being the completely insurmountable one, but I'll humour the game as it was at release. If this was Joseph's plan from the start, then nothing makes any sense. Project at Eden's Gate doesn't quite work if you blow up the Eden's Gate and everyone in the project. If this became the plan at the end, it still doesn't work because the silos were, as far as we knew, destroyed. If he took the nukes that were in the silos out and detonated them elsewhere, why did the locations correspond to the silos? Joseph was either right, or he killed everyone that could have been convinced by a lie. The real reasons the locations correspond to the silos is because they are the seeds of doubt. I struggle to believe that Ubisoft would put such attention to detail into this game, to the point where the zombies quote the radio songs and then fail to realise how much ambiguity is presented here. They wanted you to question this, because to present absolute clarity would be a betrayal of everything they had done up to this point. From the side content to the entirety of Faith's region. From the introduction to the words spoken by every single villain upon their death. It doesn't matter that the hoax theory falters. It matters it was meant to be there. It matters that people were confused. It even matters that it seems a lot of people wanted it to be true, and just as many did not. You see, that Far Cry 5 does what it does with paranoia, I find evidenced insuperably. The question is why. And the answer is the same thing that explains why the world ended in nuclear war specifically, not God's righteous fire. Because nuclear war is our chaos. Far Cry 5's socio-political tirades, once from Joseph, another from the Marshal, and numerous in the form of speeches, were relevant and as convincing as they needed to be. Now you know why I showed you that cutscene in its entirety. Now you know why I did so after letting We Will Rise Again play through. Where John is completely mental and Jacob is nearly impossible to sympathise with, it's not hard to agree that modern political leadership leaves us in a profoundly dangerous place. Society is severely flawed and the promises it makes can be hollow. It's not hard to agree that we all feel some level of dissatisfaction with the nature of modern life in the way the Marshal describes. We live mundane lives, just doing what someone else tells us to do. Day. This is the chaos. This is our chaos. The chaos we all see and we all fear in the age of divide for profit media. We're addicted to watching the flames dance and scream. Why do you think they sacrificed so much for a silent protagonist? Joseph wasn't talking to the deputy. He was talking to you, which combined with a borderline hypnotic presentation allows Eden's Gate, Faith, and Joseph himself to prey on you, just like they could outside the walls of fiction. Division. That's the word of the times, isn't it? Here's something else that sounds relevant. And then of course we need, well we need streaming music. And we need streaming TV and streaming movies and streaming news and then streaming opinion and streaming truth and streaming lies and lies and lies screaming in our heads. And we consume without purpose. And we consume without reason. And we consume without regard for one another. Joseph's touching on something similar to what Hideo Kojima was trying to say with Metal Gear Solid 2, that the internet would become a great, incomprehensible, nihilistic chaos, where truth is impossible to access under the mountains and mountains of conflicts, manipulations and lies. Through a Nietzschean lens, this would become the breeding ground for radicalization and ideological possession, as we naturally latch on to religion-like belief structures that guide us through the maze, with simplistic hero-villain black and 
white dichotomies. God is dead, but we have never been so clamorous for guidance. And so we take shelter. Trouble is, if a belief set is a form of shelter, followers will become emotionally dependent. They will defend it tooth and nail, and they will seek to expand the shelter as far and wide as possible, to turn the unknown into the known. This is why so many massive contemporary belief sets seem only to perpetuate their narratives, to replicate like genes, until you have a million foot soldiers, but without a solid study between them. What would we need understanding for? We need weapons. Don't be surprised to see hypocrisy. We're not playing the game you think we are. Politics is a war of solutions, right? But I turn on the news, I go online, and that can seem more like a pretense. When we're told about policy, how many care? We certainly care about the identity of this week's shooter, though, because that allows us to validate and spread that idea we worship so, our shelter. Would you rely on a detective to be objective with a case involving their child? Then why assume you could remain objective when you emotionally depend on your belief set? That doesn't mean the beliefs are wrong or unimportant, but it does mean your dependence stifles your growth and your sight. And where does that lead us? To enabling horrors beyond comprehension. For a mimetic virus, it's the ultimate evolution to appear to us like a drug. I could bathe in the bliss of a comforting idea, and all it would cost is my sight. It's a scam. How could the blinded tell when they so too pay the price of their virtue? Technological distance keeps the fighting down, but the chaos burns so bright it may drive us to madness. Think about what I just said. It's a war that creates and sustains itself. It's a flame that can't die down because the media provides everlasting kindling. It's our new mechanically automated engine of social division. Beautiful, isn't it? When you feel drowned in the hatred and madness online, there are three easy ways out. Narcissism, possession, and nihilism. Do not give in to temptation. Ask yourself instead, who made it this way? A perfectly divided populace within an Overton window the size of a pinprick. You see, it isn't left versus right. It's us versus them. Uh-oh. See how easy that was? How simple? I told you to think about what I just said. You can agree, but do you agree for the right reasons? Truth can only exist with nuance. I've given you the black and white, the comfort, and all I have to do now is present you with my twisted path. Maybe that's the point. Faith's exact words, come see the world beyond the maze. This chaos, it knows you're scared. It knows you're clamorous to be led to safety. The temptation of an idea. That's what Eden's Gate is. They follow this structure like a recipe. They see the chaos, our chaos. I can see that, you can see. And they'll use every trick in the book to ramp up that uncertainty and convince you the path that benefits them is the right one. They are the snake in the Garden of Eden. Paranoia is an additional replication of the chaos's uncertainty. That can be preyed upon, as they do. Consider that when you're hypnotized by music that should be considered a public danger, Far Cry 5 is trying to make you just a little suggestible to its own indoctrination. Ubisoft might have done their jobs a little too well. I laugh as I write this to the tune of Faith's Bliss and scroll down to the comments only to find yet more proof of widespread vindication and defense of Eden's Gate. This is a minority, of course, but the fact that it's noticeably significant is interesting. Look at any of Joseph's speeches. Look at any of the music tracks. Look at this. Please try this yourself, but don't make it a drinking game or you'll be in the ER before the video ends. Their justification is that the cult was right. That's why a join Joseph option is such a common request, and that's why some latched on to the prophet idea. Joseph diagnosed the world, but then he hung innocence from bridges. Evil's favorite dress is salvation. Far Cry 5's focused presentation, with such a consistent thematic pattern of paranoia, relevant exposures of chaos, and even troves of far too successful cases, lead to two simple conclusions. One cannot exist alongside the other, but that might not matter. I'm nagged by the notion that Far Cry 5 is so hypnotic, simply because it makes Far Cry 5 a more engaging product. Sympathetic villains are often interesting villains. Why should the same logic not apply here? It does, but consider the nature of the bliss as an analogue for indoctrination. They chose scopolamine for a reason. Though intention doesn't especially matter, the second possibility is this, and I'd say the leaning is favourable. Far Cry 5's message is you. 
because all it'll take is a little introspection for you to see whichever ways you might have been played. It even gives you the opportunity. You see, some hang on to the hoax theory like their life depends on it. The reason for why that is highlights Far Cry 5's second message, and amongst the flames, immense dissatisfaction. Infinitely more common than those who wanted to join the cult were those who had deeply sour thoughts on this ending, and I certainly understand. The boss fight is a joke, walk away feels underbaked, and any way you have it, your efforts were for nothing. Resist has your friends die, walk away has only you come on the radio, and, well, you can imagine what happens next. Hoax or not, you and your mates are fucked. I like that. Others didn't. Some latched onto the hoax explanation because it at least allows them to hold up that hero-villain dichotomy. But is that what was intended? Is it what this game was trying to say? If you wish to understand Far Cry 5, look around you. This is the Rapture. This is the Book of Revelation come to pass. What was the first thing the Father said to you? And I saw, and behold, it was White Horse, and Hell followed with him. What was the Sheriff's name again? And who follows him, if not Joseph's demon? New Dawn confirms this symbolism. He knew what would happen the moment you met, but he was blind to see that the other three horsemen stood right behind him. And out came another horse. Bright red, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another. And he was given a great sword, war. And there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in his hand. Famine. John is in charge of supplies and requisitions. His stronghold is Black Horse Bunker. For the fourth horseman, Eden's Gate deviates from Christianity. In the Book of Revelation, it would be Hades, the player who follows death. But death is faith, hence the zombies and the pale green color palette. With indoctrination so thoroughly linked to bliss, and bliss linked to death, this symbolic and literal comparison of indoctrination with the death of self is only the latest in the long line of ways the game hammers this point home. Instead, Hades is the devil, and the devil follows conquest. The first horseman to arrive before the end times. That's why the sheriff is the first person you lay eyes on. And the first seal was broken when White Horse chose to become conquest. That leaves the Scarlet Woman, the villain of Revelation. Once, she represented Rome. So very interesting that Joseph and his family were born in Rome. Georgia. Now it is the governments, the impotent leaders, the empires of the world and modern society that Joseph means to vilify. Was it not them who caused the collapse? Was not a deputy, an agent of government, the one who played his devil? Is that not exactly what David Koresh would have thought at Waco? And again like Koresh, I presume Joseph believes himself to be the Lamb, a title for Jesus who he quotes verbatim upon defeat. Give them, Father. They know not what they do. And his prophecy came true, but he was not the Messiah, for he did not see the snakes in his garden, nor his own sin. But he did see yours. When are you gonna realize that every problem cannot be solved with a bullet? When you first came here, I gave you the choice to walk away. You chose not to. In the face of God, I am making you that offer one last time. Every slime, every injustice, and every choice reveals our sin. John was wrong. Your sin is not wrath. So you'd rather watch the world suffer and burn than swallow your pride. This choice, though light in its weight, means everything it was made to be. Joseph is a hypocrite and a liar, but he is right about this. There are a multitude of reasons to pick Resist, but no doubt most players chose it because it seemed like the obvious good guy choice. We're meant to bang bang shooty shooty until the villain is dead, right? That's what we assume, and that makes Joseph right. Not because I said it, because he said it, and Faith did too. Joseph told you exactly who you were. Then his heralds told you what you'd do, and you did everything he said you would. And now the world is on fire, and there is no one left to save or be the savior. Your choice here was predicted, prophesized. Joseph's diagnosis of you was perfect. Its message is you. 
Again, this is another reason we observe this mountain of paranoid messaging in the game. It's about making you question not just whether or not you're right. Become wrath. Let it fill your body and consume your soul, because in the end, you'll still be empty but also whether or not you're good. That way, Far Cry 5 does not present a clear hero-villain dichotomy. There is evil, and there is more evil come to stop it. Surely it should not shock that in a game about religious, ideological, and cult possession, the writers would refuse to present a reductionist black and white moral worldview, and highlight the hypocrisy of our situation. We are possessed by the idea of the fight. We are devoted to violence. There was a happy ending. It's letting Joseph be at the start. Sometimes the best thing to do is to walk away. Do not mistake this for vindication of the father. It doesn't even say the cult should not have been resisted. It merely fulfills its own prophecy. You were told who you were, and then you slaughtered everyone. And because of it, no one lives but you and Joseph in a tiny bunker. That was hubris, not wisdom or virtue. Be disgusted at what you see. But tell me, on your journey, to these people, most of whom had no choice, you did nothing worse. What is the nature of the devil? Satan, to be specific. He, Lucifer, is a fallen angel. In that is a message of good turned to evil, and the evil is the spirit who constantly denies. According to Faust, which I'd say is the best interpretation of Ezekiel 28.12, he denies in his arrogance and selective ignorance that the chaos, its great and terrible web of nuances, even exists. He believes that he understands the nature of truth, and there is nowhere to grow, nor more knowledge to attain. Satan believes himself complete. He is the coward. The hero is brave, and there are no heroes here. Joseph was right about you. You were right about him. A perfect representation of the war that ends the world, is it not? That two equally opposed but blinded forces reduce this life and beauty to ash. This interpretation of Lucifer forms the basis of New Dawn. You've got the tree of knowledge and the theme of hubris linked directly to a literal devil, but that concept has its roots here. The curse of humanity is that we all see the throne of the gods, and we are so very tempted by its vacancy. Joseph thought himself a prophet, so the final way we will examine this game is through the lens of prophecy. Joseph comes across as a modern-day Nostradamus, in that he was supposedly possessed, or visited by some manner of prophetic spirit, assumed in this case to be God, and then mapped it onto a readily available framework, which for Nostradamus was astrology, and for Joseph is Christianity. What I find so intriguing about this is the link between Christianity and astrology by virtue of the year itself. Ions are Carl Jung's way of grouping ages of humanity, which often relate conjunctions of the planets to shifts in our collective unconscious, mainly regarding God. Sounds metaphysical, but the esotericism of it is a seven-hour discussion in and of itself. Point is, the trend line is supposedly away. Like Nietzsche said, God is dead. And some philosophers have argued that we now treat technology as a replacement. We have built our new God and we will continue to build better ones. The Ion is moving again, every 2,000 years, and we're right on schedule. On the precipice of this change, and after having been visited by a Nostradamus-like spirit, Joseph not only seeks to return us to the concept of a natural god, but also to reject our mechanical replacement entirely. What Joseph personifies, then, is the old world, desperately trying to save us from what's about to come. But being the old world, it failed horribly. From whichever way I look at this story, I see some level of poetic righteousness that we would both falter. I aim to make four points. One, that Far Cry 5 is infinitely deeper than it was given credit for. Two, that it intended at least half of it. Three, that Far Cry 5 has nothing to say, if only you choose not to listen. And four, that choosing not to listen is no sin, primarily because you might not even think I'm right. You might see things completely differently. But similarly obvious is that Far Cry is a mainstream action FPS. It didn't get there because of what it said. It got there through gameplay setting and villains. We aren't predisposed to analyze them. For those who might have and chose not to all the same, could anyone blame them? 
mind-numbing allied characters, technical faults, repetitive captures, and John's weak, uninteresting beliefs can understandably deafen ears. The message could even come across as hypocritical or unfair. We are possessed to slaughter because games, like most released by Ubisoft, tell us to, and not to question it. There's an irony to it. It can dull the idea, though it wouldn't be the first time Ubisoft's products critique the company's behavior. Far Cry 5 deserved a defense, not an exaltation. It made me feel doubtful and like a hypocrite. And I've seen it happen to so many others, but it could be for just as many reasons that it did not happen for you. All of them good, apart from one. And for that, first I need to introduce you to a premise. I could walk you through in sequence everything written about this game in its vicious but surprisingly bipartisan political flaying that was blind to its barest intentions, let alone what it did have to say. Some were scared that it would be an attack on rural Americans. Some were upset that it didn't fire the shots it could have. In acknowledgement of the volatility of even discussing the politics of the game's media, I want you to know I bear absolutely no ill will. I understand Ubisoft's positions on these things are often frustrating, and I have immense respect for their prowess as writers. But they are in a position to arbitrate truth. Truths like the cult was not apolitical. Even someone completely uneducated such as myself could gleam a clear reading and have it check out against New Dawn. What I told you was just my analysis, but the test comes back positive. Of course they don't fit on a Democrat-Republican axis. Makes sense given the fact that they hate modern society and think the world is going to end in a matter of days. Not exactly an appropriate Overton window. Truths like, the game was developed before Donald Trump ran for the Republican primary, so he couldn't be more central even if that were wise. One such article is a blip. Three is a coincidence, but there's not one, there's 38. After that, I stopped counting, and I started writing. What the Marshal said and what he didn't say keeps this game relevant but not dated. There will always be the chaos. There will always be the tempting embrace of possession. There will always be nihilism in modern society, strife and fear and confusion in the American and every political sphere. There will not always be Donald Trump. There will be what presidential politics represents. Additionally, many of these pieces felt it was deeply wrong to shy away from more vile ideas espoused by cults comparable to Eden's Gate, or comparable to the Branch Davidians, their direct inspiration. Though comparability surely does not indebt Far Cry 5 to an exploration. In the same way, Far Cry 4 did not owe commentary on similar dictatorships. The reason Ubisoft wouldn't even broach the subject is obvious. You can't advertise a game like this, have random bouts of ridiculous light heartedness and then litter it with modern racial abuse, but more so in a game that ravenously tries to get you to see the cult side, to indoctrinate you. Things might not go quite to plan if it worked to any degree. To adequately manage the risk of what if they're right, the very nature of the game would need to change fundamentally. Their most convincing position was on gun culture. There is no way the cult could have done what they did without it. There is no way the people could have resisted without it either. To not even afford it the barest mention was surely an intentional choice, and the reason surely was to avoid backlash. That may not be an inherent flaw, but if it disappointed, I accept that. You know I do, because I critique the game for not using its assets more. What I don't accept is the sentiment that Far Cry 5 fails to make a statement simply because it did not make the right one. The world ending is a fair enough hint it's trying to tell you something. It is American Far Cry, and not a coward or a monster in being that way. The only demon is the one it makes of you. Fear's temptations have always been the devil's snare, an ideology, a religion, a cult. And alongside it, a villain, a changed self, beauty and the beast, a predator and prey. Familiarity could have killed Far Cry 5, but it is so very alive. I am as sure of that now as I was in 2018, when I thought of it as the final piece in Ubisoft's golden trifecta. After 2014, with public perception comparable to bird shit on a wheelie bin, it was Watch Dogs 2, Assassin's Creed Origins, and Far Cry 5, three strong entries in their mainline franchises that seemed to set Ubisoft back on the right path. In 2020, we've seen just how long that lasted. They'll need a fuck sight more than games to pull it off again. And God makes work for idle hands. Better get cracking. The same could be said for me. Maybe next time you'd like to see how Joseph's handling retirement. No! 
and just where the more literal Scissor Sisters are finding all their pink paint. I'd love to see where Far Cry could take us. Thank you for watching. I've got to give special thanks to Ren's Reviews, who helped me with the audio editing and the ad for this video. He's recently been pumping out some absolute bangers, and he's about to release a Call of Duty Cold War video, so I highly recommend going over to his channel and checking him out. Special thanks also go to Chimera in a Suit for the CGI intro, and Leslie Giselle for the Only You cover. I was actually going to try and sing it myself. Um, it didn't quite go to plan, so I had to make a last minute change, and I think it was a, a much better choice. She has a wonderful voice, and I'll have all her links in the description and the comment. Additional special thanks go to Fabian Flack, Elijah Hayden, Chino, Fernando Marquez, Alex Graft, Linus Newman, Nathaniel Haskins, Austin Novosel, Daniel Waylan, Caleb Doss, Newts, Flip Slip Me Dick, Warthol, I Know Lucky, Effectfully, Mardi, Mr. T with some T, Gurniel, John Lemley, Bishop Nelson, Benjamin Carter, Lex Williams, L. Hudson, Soren 066, or is it 066? I don't know. Dubstep Gutter Fan 92, that's still an amazing name. Darren Chambers, Jonathan Turnell, Jonathan Tunnel, Z, 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 2468, Michael Gamel, Denver Nichols, Gwyneth, Vladimir Obukov, Jake, Dappy Dad, Lubomir Mitkov, Tide Pods, Hamish, Christopher Richardson, Hypocrite, Norm Ambroise, Nines, That's for the Birds, Brendan McDonald, Keshav Rangan, Jason Vickery, Brandon Harris, Alsis Wild, Attila, Nathan, Rakin Hock, Justin, Cameron Bowen, Uriara Heap, Devontae Williams, Matophobia, Dan Walker, Yeet Lord, The Last Great Opium Den, George Fitz Boodle, Bosian Tutu, Joshua W. Shriner, Sai, Shade, Quarter Gamer, Ballistic Rainbow, Chance Tucker, Drop ZZ, Combat Wombat, Juris Purins, Holy Shift, Andre Baltuta, Leon Cuttendal, Abby, Dominic Jaworski, Glorious Sexy Beast, and DJ.